Good evening. I hope you paid close attention to the reading that Tim did for us in the 105th Psalm. And I know that if we did, that, of course, is information that is very familiar to us as the psalmist reflects back to the time that the Hebrew people were in the land of Egypt, but as God sent the ten plagues upon the land, that Pharaoh might eventually let the people go. And I hope that what you notice, particularly in verse 38, and I want to ask really as a question, did you know that the Egyptians were glad when the Israelites were finally and completely out of Egypt? The last verse that Tim read, and I'd asked him to go ahead and stop at verse 38, there it says, Egypt was glad when they, which is referring to Israel, departed, for the fear of them had fallen on them. What a reversal. I want you to think about this. That we know that what went on in this record that is found in the book of Exodus and that the psalmist refers to in the 105th Psalm. There was that time that Egyptians mother, Egyptian mothers mourned because of the death of their firstborn children as a result of the 10th plague. The record of God says to us in Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 29, that now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt for the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all of the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. But then we know that as a little bit of time passes on, that soon, many of those mourning mothers became grieving widows when not so much as one of their husbands returned after God disabled the chariot wheels of the pursuing Egyptian army, causing the soldiers to drown in the Red Sea. We go two chapters later, later in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 14, and beginning at verse 27, it is written, So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one of them remained. Thousands of young Egyptian soldiers perished by drowning in the Red Sea. Some of you may be familiar with a well-known commentator by the name of Matthew Henry, who has written a classical commentary in the entire Bible. And Matthew Henry astutely wrote of these now suffering Egyptians, and I quote, they might have left Israel alone and would not. Now they would flee from the face of Israel and cannot. To most of those Egyptians, and perhaps even to Pharaoh himself, how they wished they had never seen a Hebrew, though they had been their workforce, they had been the slaves, they were responsible for, for building many of the Egyptian cities, of which we now know not only by the biblical record, but much of the archaeological record as well. And so the Egyptians, according to the psalmist, were glad when the Israelites were out of their lives. But here's what I like most, I think, about this account. The message that it gives to us all of these centuries later. You see, the Red Sea crossing reminds us 
that God finds a way when we can't. When we think that we are in such peril or such difficulty, circumstances of our lives, and we wonder, what can we do? That is why we must turn our trust completely to God, because God finds a way when we can't. Well, as I thought about that, Egypt was glad when Israel departed it got me to thinking, and as we're going to do an analysis in James chapter 4, and I'd like everybody please to turn their Bibles, and we'll not be leaving at this point James 4 too much, a couple of cross-references here and there. But did you know that there is a time when Satan is glad to get away from God's people, from Christians? And what I found parallel in this is in as much as the wicked, evil Egyptians under the leadership of the hardened-hearted Pharaoh. And as they wanted Israel to leave, they wanted to depart, they wanted to be that separation. I think that it's very interesting, even an irony, that there are times that Satan is glad to go his separate way from us. James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. We'll begin at verse 6. James 4, beginning at verse 6. James writes, and we're going to be coming up to these passages on the Sunday morning lesson, why my mind's around these passages. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. In the Exodus, and in that count, account, Initially, there was that time that Israel wished to flee from Egypt, but were not allowed to because, again, of Pharaoh. And so they were met with that opposition, and their lives were made miserable until God would send to them this leader and this deliverer by the name of Moses. But even there, when Moses approaches Pharaoh, and he says that the God of the Hebrew people says, let my people go, Pharaoh was not going to do it, and that, of course, brought about the ten plagues. And it took that tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, when he finally said, leave. Then we understand that he hardens his heart again, and he says to his armies, go get them and bring them back. But as we just referred to, that ended in tragedy. And because of that, as I have tried to establish, that Egypt was glad to see them go. But now here, in this irony, that when we look at the text that we have before us, James poses a situation where we're going to see that Satan is glad for himself to separate from the people of God. That the devil wishes to do the fleeing when Christians conduct themselves according to God's will. That's the message of this paragraph. That when we conduct ourselves, when we behave or act in the ways that God wants us to do in accordance with His will, and when we are diligent in doing that, that's when Satan is glad to go his separate way. But I'll tell you what. We recognize that it's a battle. It's a battle. And as much as there were the forces of good and evil in the days of of, of the Israelites, the Hebrew people in Egypt. And as much as it was a spiritual battle, as we were chronicle all of the history of the biblical times and going right to the times of the life of Christ and the New Testament church and the writings of James, and we see that there's always a battle going on, the battle between good and evil. Is it any different today? It's not any different today. Driving down the road, just about Thursday, I think it was, Heading back to the office and the song came on. 
And it's a Bob Seger song. It's classic Against the Wind. Against the Wind. And in that line that speaks of forgotten innocence, I love that line. When he says in that, I only wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. You see, I remember the time when I was young and innocent. And there's a lot of things that I didn't know. Oh, but I wish that I knew them. But I only wish now that I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Because of this, the presence of evil, God shows us the good. God has displayed the good. And God is saying, listen, here's how you need to handle it. This is how you need to face the issues of life. Yes, even the temptation that comes our way. Therefore, it is worth our time to analyze this concise passage so that we can experience the this, this spiritual phenomenon that Satan will go the other way. And there are actually six simple but profound principles expressed in the text. And what I want to say to you, I, I submit to you, I would argue that Satan is glad to go his separate way when we submit to God. He says, therefore, submit to God. Satan is glad to go his separate way to get away from us when we submit to God. Therefore, submit to God is this powerful statement that James offers. Submission, submitting to God. It's all, it all depends on to whom we're going to submit. This word, hupotasso, which is found a good number of times in the Greek New Testament, and it's the idea of, of, of what to arrange in an orderly manner, to put in order, yes, but the idea is to put oneself under the order or the arrangement of another. When I submit to someone, I'm putting myself under the order or the arrangement of somebody else. I'm letting somebody else take control, and I submit. What does he say? Therefore, submit to God. I'm going to suggest to you that the argument of the case that he's building is that when we submit to God, Satan's going to flee. One lexicon brought out the point in reference to hupotasso, this word submit, that was primarily, originally, a military term to rank under. To rank under that when you are a, a subservient and when there is a superior officer that you rank under, that you are to submit to that superior officer. And when they say go, you go. And they say come, you come. And when they give an order, you submit. Therefore, submit to God. You know, we find out in Scripture, if we even think of the time... When Jesus was, was approached by Satan in the temptation of Matthew chapter 4, after having fasted for 40 days, all alone in the wilderness, being tempted by those three, three avenues of temptation we talked about just not long ago, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And Jesus, every time, what does he do? He answers the temptation with Scripture. And he's submitting to the Word of God. He's submitting, he's allowing God's Word to become real in his life. That's how, my friends, we submit to God. And you know what? He did that. At the end of that, and he has successfully beat the devil at his own game, on his own ground, at his own time. And you know what the record says to us in Matthew 4, 11? Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. And one thing I found out about the devil, that when we submit to God and to his word, the devil, that's when we find out that Satan is a coward. He's not nearly as strong. As he wants us to think. Satan is glad to go his separate way when we submit to God. But then we understand that Satan is glad to go when we do resist him. That is that we make that concerted, that conscious effort to resist him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When we resist him, that is Satan. He's going to go the other way. That's the importance of this little last part or section of verse number seven. We have another interesting word found here. It almost looks like antihistamine. 
Now, there may actually be something to that, by the way. But anti is, can be opposed to or the opposite of, but hestimi is to stand in place, therefore. But it is to stand against something, and so I don't want to go down the road of antihistamines. But I do want us to understand that when he says resist the devil, that this is something that we take a stand, but whatever stand that we take, that here is the devil, and the stand that we take is the opposite stand of, of the devil. So that whatever the devil stand he takes, whatever he says, whatever he believes in, whatever he does, whatever, that we're going to stand opposite because that's what the resisting is. It is, it is a resisting. Defined to stand a place, therefore to stand against. And we think then of what Peter says just in the very next book in, in 1 Peter chapter 5. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and beginning at verse number 8, it says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We know that's what he does. But watch this. Resist him. You see that in verse 9? Resist him. That is what James is saying in our text. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And, and there's even strength in that when we know that other people, other brethren, are facing the same challenges, but as we're doing the same thing, standing in opposition to the devil, resisting him. When we are diligent in that, what is the promise? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I'll tell you, that is such hope and such promise that the devil, that Satan does not do well with those who actively stand against him. When we actively stand against him, it goes right back to his cowardice nature. When we stand against him, when we say no, when we stand in opposition to all that he is and every temptation or avenue of temptation that he uses, but give him an inch and he will secure a victory. You see, Satan is glad to go his separate way when we submit to God. When we resist him and all that that means and takes, he will flee, flee from you, but then what do we need to do next so that he'll keep fleeing and go the opposite way. Draw near to God and he that is God will draw near to you. The import of verse 8 of drawing near to God and God that is he will draw near to you. And we have yet one other word. It's really the last of the word studies I wanted to do. But I just found these three so interesting. In Engizo. Whenever you have a, a double gamma, double G, it's always like an E-N-G. It's pronounced eng, engizo. To make near, to approach. We understand that idea, to draw near. That is, we try to get closer and closer to God. And how do we do that? To draw near to God? Well, it has a lot to do, first of all, with our total confidence in God's plan through Jesus Christ and His blood and, and our absolute dependence upon it. And so in our obedience to the gospel, and that's how we begin to draw near to God and to be in fellowship with God. Right. But then again, as we are very active in His Word, and every day as we draw near to God, yes, active in His Word, active in our prayer life, our petitions to God, Draw near to God, and the beautiful thing is this, you draw near to God, and He, God, will draw near to you, to us. And here's the devil, when we're doing that, we're drawing near to God, and God's getting close to us, let me ask you, does the devil even want to be in the neighborhood? He doesn't. He doesn't. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. I love the statement that's made by the psalmist in the 73rd Psalm, Psalm 73 and at verse 28. And there he says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare 
all your works. The, the recognition, the acknowledgement that it is good for me to draw near to God. This must be a conscious thing on our minds every single day. We had a couple of great days. And we understand the value. Take what the ladies did yesterday, and that's such a valuable thing. Valuable time spent of a common faith, of this common fellowship, of these common goals, and being together, and studying together, and praying together in that fellowship. And do you find strength and encouragement in that? And I hope that everybody did. And then we come on the Lord's Day, the very next day, and we come to assembly and we study God's Word in Bible class and we come to worship and we again are engaged in prayer and we're engaged in this fellowship of worship and a study of God's Word. And do we feel strength in that and as drawing near to God in worship? And God says, this is good for you because the devil doesn't want to be around it. But then tomorrow comes. You know what tomorrow is? It's my day off. <laughs> kind of. But tomorrow comes and we go back to work and we go back to our lives and we go back to all these situations. And so while we experience the emotional highs and that's all fine and good because of special events and the fellowship and of worship and of what God wants to do. And, and it really sees how important and how valuable it is to be together and to work together, to serve together in fellowship, doesn't it? But then we understand that the normal days of life come and we still need to do what? Draw near to God. And he'll draw near to us. When man and God are drawing near to each other, Satan's got to go. And go he does. And so this is James's point. Satan is glad to go his separate way as long as we're drawing near to God. But then James does encourage these brethren and even he warns them with this next expression when he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. One might have thought that I'd even maybe talk to Paul O'Connor before he led his prayer tonight, and I appreciate so much of the sentiment in your prayer tonight, Paul. And Paul did acknowledge something that is very, very true, that we are sinners. We are sinners, and we continue to have a problem with that, do we not? And James is acknowledging that, and he says to them, cleanse your hands. He's writing to these Christians. He's told them, submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and God's going to draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And the thought then occurred to me, Satan is glad to go his way when we truly repent. When we truly repent, and that's the whole idea, to cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. For let's not be duplicious, let's not be duplicious, double-minded in our thinking about trying to live a life for God here, but then somehow trying to live uh, this other life of the world and being pulled by that, and that's double-mindedness. But what we've got to do is we've got to repent, and repentance starts where? Right in the mind. Changing our thinking, changing our mind. And when we do that, when we truly repent, and when we cleanse our hands, because we're not satisfied with sin. In fact, we are very upset by sin. We are disappointed and frustrated by sin. But when we cleanse our, hand, our hands, when we purify our hearts, our hearts, when we lose that double-minded quality that we struggle with, because again, the good versus evil, there's that double-minded thing. Cleansing and purifying are the byproducts of genuine repentance, which prevents, again, this double-mindedness. That's when we lose it. And my friends, Satan cannot handle the single-minded Christian. He loves to see double-minded Christians. He loves to see people always in this tug of war, but losing and giving in and giving in and giving in. But when we become focused and when we become single-minded, he can't handle that. And they'll flee. 
Colossians chapter 3, Paul reminds the Christians in Colossae, starting at verse 1 actually. I think the reference I have may be Colossians 3, 2, but start with verse 1. Paul says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, and that's reference to their baptism, verses 2, 11 and 12. Chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. But therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. You know, we've been talking in James, in James chapter 3, we concluded this morning in the Bible class about these two different wisdoms. The worldly wisdom, very self-serving, sensual, demonic, and so forth, but the wisdom that comes from above. And when you even look at the same thing, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Where he says in verse 3, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When did we do that? When we submitted, just read chapter 2. When we submitted to him by our faith and repentance, when we submitted to him in baptism, I want to ask you, what happened to the old man of sin when we were baptized in Christ? It was buried. Buried. What, was, what came up out of the watery grave? The new person, the new creature. To walk in the newness of life, Romans 6. And so what does he say here? Your life, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. I look at this, and we understand that when we become that single-minded Christian, again, the devil, he is just, he, he cannot deal with that. We have a tendency to give him way too much credit and way too much power. Now, don't get me wrong. Let's not take anything for granted. He has power, but in so many ways, it's the power that we would give him. But when we become single-minded, he can't take it. So since this speaks of repentance, let me tell you, then James continues on. And he says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He's not talking about lamentation, mourning, and weeping because of the loss of somebody that died that was close to us in our lives. That's not the context. He's talking about the lamenting, the mourning, and the weeping because when we recognize our sin. I, I just want to ask everyone right now. Are there times that we have said things, that we have done things, that we have acted in ways that were wrong or sinful, that hurt people and hurt God, that brought us to tears. And rightfully so. Lament, mourn, and weep. You know what the world does? This is why it says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Society glamorizes sinful behavior and mocks God-fearing Christians. It's all over. It's all over. It's in the movies. It's in TV. It's in all of the media that, that society glamorizes. It glamorizes sinful behavior and it mocks Christians. You know what James does? So James turns to this reflective prophetic language by employing three imperatives, by the way, that virtually mean the same thing. That when he does that, that in repentance, the confession of sin leads not to celebration. When we confess our sin, acknowledge our sin, we don't look at our sin and celebrate it. We look at our sin and we mourn. It's not in celebration, but rather in lamenting, mourning, and weeping because of the damning nature of sin. But only the patient and penitent Christian does this. That sees the wisdom to do this. And when the Christian does this and says, and looks at their sin and they lament and they mourn and they weep, and they're not going to glamorize as the world does, but we do the opposite. The devil can't handle that either. The world, we understand, on the other hand, is in a partnership with Satan. Always has been. But when Christians take a stand and biblically repudiate sinful behavior, Satan goes elsewhere. Remember Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11? 
Paul implores in Ephesians 5.11, listen to it, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Have no fellowship, no partnership, no joint participation, no fellowship with the unfruitful, ugly works of darkness. And again, Paul even stated in the prayer of this broken world. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And when we repudiate it as such, Satan goes on his way. Well, we look at this. We see in these five points, submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, let's cleanse our hands, lament and mourn and weep. But I'll tell you what, very fittingly, how does he close it? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I would lastly argue in this text, and what makes it so critically significant, is that Satan is glad to go his separate way when we humble ourselves. When we humble ourselves. Humility. In the sight of the Lord. And what is the promise? And he, that is the Lord, will lift you up. We do enough of lifting ourselves up. And we like it when there are other people in the world, even friends or society, lifts us up and they honor us for various things. And maybe noteworthy achievements and successes that we've experienced in this life. But I'll tell you what, when we find ourselves so lifted up by the world and by society or by our, or by our own standards of our own selves, Satan's licking his chops. But humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he, God, will lift you up. Exaltation is only commendable if it is the Lord who does the lifting up. However, self-exaltation, which is prompted by pride by arrogance, plays right into Satan's scheming ways. And it's called the pride of life. You see, it's not just a matter of the lust of the flesh and of those fleshly desires. And not just the lust of the eyes and what we see. And those are two avenues that, that Satan uses quite effectively. But about the pride of life. But yet here is James telling us that Satan quickly departs from the humble Christian that experiences the loving grace, the favor of God. Again, in James 4, 6, go back to verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How many of us want to experience and heavily really have the grace and the gifts of God and all that that means? It's going to be seen in humility. Brother, all I can say in conclusion is this lesson then, if we want Satan going the other way, glad to go that separate way, we must humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. We submit to God. When it comes to Satan, the devil, let's send him on his way. But that's going to take some work and diligence, isn't it? These are astute expressions. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Lament, mourn, and weep. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. That is God's methodology for whipping the devil in his own game. And I hope that we will take it to heart. If we can help and assist anyone with their walk with God, their wanting to come to God, whatever your spiritual need may be, I hope that we will, we will indeed take advantage of what God offers. We can help. Let that be known as we stand, as we sing the song that is